Seth, I'll, I'll say this. When I look at you, I see your dad. And when you talk, I hear your dad. And uh, I appreciate your dad. One time, we were up there at uh, Bible Way Baptist Church. I can't remember if it was Wilkesboro or North Wilkesboro. Wilkesboro. And we went out to this restaurant. There's three, there was four of us, my wife and I, a fellow named Kenny Davis, young preacher, preaching him Harsh Minton. And uh, we were parked at the church, and we were, we were just kind of getting started back in evangelism. We didn't have any meetings. And uh, Brother Seisloff let us park there at the church a little bit. So we just went to revival every night somewhere and egged the preacher on, said amen to, while he's preaching. And afterward, we went in this little tiny corner of a restaurant. I, I always call it a greasy spoon place. And we went in there, and they had a jukebox playing. They are playing all kinds of this wild music, just old country stuff. And uh, they ran out of coins, and Brother Harsh looked at me, and he said, well... He said, they've been hearing the devil's music. He said, I believe they need to hear some of God's music now that it's quiet in here. So we broke into song. We sang Peace Be Still. We sang The Sun's Coming Up in the Morning. And that place got quiet. And uh, all the cooks came out of the kitchen and were listening. And then all of a sudden, this lady come walking out of the kitchen, real deliberate, like kind of walked to our table. And she put her hand down on the table. And she looked at me and she said, that was beautiful. Would you sing another one? And so we sang a couple more, and then we left. We went back up to that church, and we were in this little, I believe it was a Pinto or a Maverick, something like that. Brother Harsh said, Brother Kenny, you pray, and he got to praying. And it started out with four of us in the car and ended up with seven of us in the car. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost crawled in that car with us. And I'm going to tell you, we had a time. I jumped out that. It got too small for all of us. I jumped out that door and ran around that bottom of that mountain and hollered and praised God and worshiped and cried and wept. We just had some good times up there in the services and out of the services. And I'm glad the Sysloffs are here, and I appreciate them. I, I find that the more it happens more and more, I go to places, and this is how they introduce me. I remember hearing Brother McBride preach when I was a little boy or a little girl. I don't know how that happens, but I guess in some ways I'm glad about it. Amen. And I'm glad to be with Brother Josh and his family and glad to be with you tonight. And uh, I, you just have to forgive me. When you get old, you reminisce a little bit. I want you to look with me. We're going to read three passages of Scripture tonight. We're going to start in Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26. And then we're going to read in Mark 14, and then we're going to read in John chapter 12. But we'll start in Matthew 26. It's good to see Sister Pethel here tonight in the service. Preached for her husband many a time and spent some wonderful times around their table at the house and at the church. Good to see her tonight. Matthew 26 and verse number 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of pre very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured the ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. And if you look in Mark chapter number 14 for a moment, verse number 3. Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman, having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whenever you will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. 
She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And then John chapter number 12. Then Jesus, six days, verse 1, before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom he had raised from the dead. Now I want to preach a little while on this passage and these three passages, and I know tonight there is some discussion amongst Bible students whether all three of these are the same event, and I won't fuss with you about it, and I hope you won't fuss with me about it. Uh, but I want to talk to you about these, and I want to use some things from all three of these events. They are so similar in what has taken place. And I want to deal with this thought tonight. I want to think about wasted worship. Wasted worship. Now let me say at the outset, and I'm going to pray in a moment, real worship is never a waste. Worship is never is never something that was wasteful in its activity. So when I say wasted worship tonight, I'm not saying that what this woman did was a waste or when you worship it is ever wasteful. But they use this word, why was this waste of the ointment made? And there was a wastefulness here, it was not the worship, but they wasted their opportunity to get involved in worship. And I don't ever want to waste an opportunity to worship the Lord. Let's pray a moment and we'll talk about this. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us first. I pray you'll help us tonight. You've put a lot of things on my mind and on my heart today. And I pray you'll bring them as has already been prayed to my remembrance. And help me to say them the way you've had, you would have them said. And I pray, Lord, that we will be worshipers of you not just tonight in this service, but in every moment of our lives, that our lives will be lives of worship because, Lord, you are worthy of our worship. Help us now tonight, I pray, to get our eyes focused upon thee tonight and to worship thee in spirit and in truth. You help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you what a writer, a writer I enjoy reading, August Van Rijn. I want to read to you what he said about these passages. I'm just going to read it to you. He said, how precious to the heart of the Savior must have been Mary's sacrificial love poured out on him so shortly before the vile man was to pour forth on him his gall and guilt. Matthew, Mark, and John record this incident. John tells us definitely that it took place six days before the final Passover. Matthew and Mark put it down out of its proper chronological place for this reason, because it has a significance of sharp contrast to what the world is going to do to the Lord in just a little while. Mary's loving ministry and worship, Judas' shameful, uh, Judas's shameful perfidy, Peter's bad renunciation, the bitter animosity of the nation's leaders will be a contrast to what Mary has done here. He talks about the fact that in two of these passages, Mary pours the ointment upon his head, but in John, she pours it upon his feet. And, and Mr. Van Ryan made this statement. He said, in those two passages, we have Jesus pouring Portrayed. You know he's portrayed in different ways in the gospel. But in John, he is the, he is the God of heaven. God manifest in the flesh.
flesh, and yet he has humbled himself and came down and walked on this earth as a human to die in our place. And so in John, it's not the head, but it's the feet. And it is an indication of his condescension. The God of the universe became flesh so that you and I could be saved. So as he comes, she worships him. And to those watching, the disciples, including Judas, to them, this seems to be a waste. To them, it was a wasted time. But here's what it was. It was a wasted opportunity on their part to worship the Lord. Now, I'm wondering in our Christian life how many times we have wasted the opportunity to be involved in the worship of God. Something's got in our way. Something's got us sideways. Something's got us sidetracked. And mostly the reason we don't worship is because we're looking in the wrong place. I'm going to tell you, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, it'll put some worship in your heart because the more you see him, the better he looks. You know, it's an interesting thing in this world. You look at something, the closer you look at it, usually the more faults you find. Uh, you look at it from far off. I, I, I got involved years ago. I had a little co- a, a pocket knife collection, and the Lord kind of got, he sort of convicted me about spending money on them, and so I quit spending money on them, and I gave them all away. And uh, you know what happens when you give things away? People start giving things back to you. That's a biblical principle. So now guess what? I got another pocket knife collection. But I noticed this about pocket knives. You can look at them and if you look at them on the, a picture of them on the internet or, or, or maybe on an auction site or something, boy, they look good. But then when you get your hands on it, you get a closer look. You start finding the flaws. It's like that in everything in life except for one thing. And that's the Lord Jesus. The closer you look at him, uh, the more flawless he becomes. The more perfect he looks. The more beautiful he is. And if you don't think he's beautiful tonight, it's because you haven't taken a good look at him. If you don't think he's worthy of worship tonight, it's because you haven't taken a close look. But if you and I would take a close look at him tonight, we'd find out that he's worthy of our worship. We'd find out that he's the fairest among ten thousands. We'd find out he's the lily of the valley. We'd find out he's the rose of Sharon. We'd find out that he is the glory of heaven and of earth if we take a look. So I want to say three things to you tonight about this worship and why they wasted their worship, their opportunity. The first thing that causes us often to waste our opportunity is because our eyes are on the price of the worship. What will it cost us to worship God? I remember a young man, he visited a church and he got angry and he never came back and here's why he never came back. Because the pastor, after he thanked him for coming out in the foyer, the pastor said to him, now tell me, uh, young man, what gifts do you bring to our church. Now, here's what the preacher's talking about. He's talking about the gift of the Spirit. He was trying to get that young man to see that God had a purpose for him, but that young man looked at it completely different. He thought that preacher was saying, well, what kind of money are you bringing us? What are you going to bring? And so he got mad. He never went back. The price, even a suggestion of a price of worship was too much for him. Sometimes we don't worship because we're thinking about the cost of it. Let me ask you this. Is the thing that we love more important important than having him. The thing that we have. Are our possessions more important than our prince? Is comfort more of a consideration than Christ? Are we more concerned with the coins than with Calvary? Are we thieves stealing the glory from God to fill out our rotting bags? You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Haggai, the Bible said, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now, here's what he was saying. The temple had been destroyed, and it was time to rebuild it in Ezra's day. And, but they were rebuilding their houses. When he talked about sealed houses, I guess probably every house has a ceiling. So why did he mention that? He was talking about ornate ceilings. He's talking about how much money they'd spent building that beautiful ceiling over their rooms in their house. And he said, you've been working on that, but the house of God lies waste. And he said this, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. 
life. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. I'm going to tell you something, friend. They said we ought to take care of the poor. Jesus said the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always. I thought about that offer in a moment. I'm so glad you did that, preacher. I thought about that offering. When you brought that offering tonight, it was worship. You say, well, you did that. We did that for those youngins. Well, in a sense we did, but mostly we did it for Jesus. Amen. They're going to profit from it, but we did it for Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what you put in that offering plate tonight. You didn't put in a bag with holes in it because the Lord's going to bless that. He'll put his hand on it in your life and in their life. I thought about Abraham. God said to Abraham one day, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee up the mountain, which I will show thee of. And offer him there a burnt offering. You know what the Bible said the next morning? Abraham got up, took his son, got the knife, got the wood, got the fire, and headed up the mountain. You know what? Abraham, Abraham did not measure. Now, he said this to the young men. They got out on their journey, and he said to the young men, he said, abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, here's what I notice about that passage. It doesn't look like Abraham ever measured the price. I don't read where Abraham said, Lord, this is too much to ask. I don't read where Abraham said, Lord, you know, I want to worship you, but it's going to cost me my son. I don't read that anywhere in the passage. But I do read this. I read that God measured the price. Now think about how God said it. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Abraham, not just your son, not just your only son, but this son whom you love. I see God tabulating, counting up, measuring the price. Abraham doesn't measure the price, but God measures the price. And so Abraham heads up on the mountain. The Lord measured the price of Abraham's worship. You say, preacher, why did he do that? Because he was fixing to reward him according to the price of his worship. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. And Abraham went up, took his son, his only son, whom he loved, and, and bound him and put him on the altar and raised the knife. And the angel of the Lord stopped him. He said, Abraham, Abraham. And then he showed him that, that ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham took the ram and offered it him a burnt offering. And then the Lord said this. I wrote it down. The Lord said this. He said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Here's what God did. God measured the price of Abraham's worship and said, Abraham, I'm going to make sure I pay you back triple fold for what it costs you to worship me. Hey, you don't need to measure the price. God's doing the measuring. Just get in on the worship. Just worship him with what you have. God measured the price of her worship and rewarded her accordingly. She came in the presence of these. She put up with trouble. She put up with what they said. And when it was all done, God said, she hath done a good work. She hath done what she could. And he said, wherever this gospel is preached, this thing shall be brought up. It will be remembered as a memorial unto her. Now, here's what happened. She didn't, she didn't count the cost. But these other fellows counted the cost. How much did it cost her to worship? Well, here's what they said when they started measuring. They said 300 pence. Now, if you read the parables, you remember the parable about those fellows that came and the guy, the, the, the husbandman, he hired them. What did he hire them at? What was the rate? A penny a day. So if that was the going rate for a day, the penny and the pence, 300 pence is almost a year's worth of wages. So here is a woman who came one day, and she has brought with her, I don't know what you brought with you tonight, but she has brought with her almost a year's worth 
of wages. And you know what she's going to do? She's going to use it all to worship Jesus. I'd say he's worth something to her. Is he worth something to you? They said, no, that's too much. That, that's too much. We can't do that. that is the, the thing that she had was not in, more important than him. You know, I thought of this. 300 pence is a portion of a year. We call it a year's wages, but let's think of it like this. If 365 days, and with the Jews, I think 360 days is how they measured it. So 300 days of her life. So what she's saying is the Lord is worthy of at least a portion of, of a year of my life. You know, I want to ask you a question. Is your Lord worth at least a portion of a year of your life? You know what the answer is? The answer is no. He is worth more than just a portion of a year of my life. He is worth everything in my life. He is worth my life from beginning to ending. He is worth everything I am and everything I have and everything I hope for. Why, preacher? Because everything I am and everything I have and everything I hope for, I owe to him because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. I am bought with a price. That's what Paul said. What, know you not your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Preacher, why would you worship him? Because he bought me. Why would you worship him? Because he died for me. Why would you worship him? Because he was buried for me. Why would you worship him? Because he rose for me and ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. He is worthy of my life and of my worship. It's true. No one ever has done for us what Christ did. But look at me. They didn't get in on the worship. It's going to cost them too much. That's what they thought. 300 pence is too much. It's too much. Some young person said, well, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to worship the Lord. I'd like to give him my life, but it'll cost me my dream. It'll cost me my ambitions. It'll cost me my hope. Well, I'm going to tell you, friend, you have no real dream. You have no, you have no worthwhile ambition. You have no hope without Christ without what he did on the cross of Calvary. Some say, I can't worship him, it'll cost him my friends. Have your friends died on the cross to save you from your sin? It'll cost me this, it'll cost me that. No, no, friend, don't think of the cost. Think of the price that Jesus paid so that you could be saved, gave his life on the cross of Calvary for you. We can't worship tonight because our eyes are on the price. What will it cost? And then here's the second reason they wasted this opportunity they couldn't worship because their eyes were on a person, the wrong person. They were looking at her. Here's what the Bible said. It said some had indignation against her. They murmured. They had indignation within themselves and murmured against her. So they're thinking about her. They're, they're, thinking, about, they're thinking about this woman. I, I don't know what they thought about her. I, I don't know. I, this is Mary. I believe Mary, the sister of Martha, and uh, I, I believe that she is the sister of Lazarus, and I, I, I don't know what they thought about her, but they had, the Bible said, they, they murmured against her. Now think about that. They murmured against her. What does she think she's doing? What does she think she's going to do with that ointment? Why is she wasting that ointment? All on her. All they could see was her. You know what the difference between them and her was? All she could see was him. And all they could see was her. Some can't worship because all you can see is somebody else. They failed you or they weren't what they thought they, you thought they should be or they weren't what they said they were going to be or there's something about And you just can't worship because of them. Your problem is and my problem is often I'm looking at the wrong person. We should be looking at him. I noticed this. I noticed they're seething about her. The Bible said indignation within themselves. In other words, there's a, there's a struggle going on in here. Does this ever happen to you when worship starts? So, well, I, I know old Joe. He shouldn't be shouting. Come on. I've seen old so-and-so, and she shouldn't be shouting. Come on now. 
Well, I think we ought to live clean, and I think we ought to live holy, but my worship's not based on me. It's about him. I want to be clean. I want to have a good testimony. I want to live for God. I don't want to be a hypocrite. But I'm going to tell you, I know how sorry I am. I know how short I've come of what I ought to be. And, and when the preacher gets up and starts telling me how much Jesus loves me and how he paid for my sin and all that he did for me, I can't help it. I know I'm not what I should be, but he's everything he said he would be. And I think I'll just go ahead and worship him about it. If you got your eyes on somebody, somebody bothered you, somebody failed you, somebody let you down, somebody said the wrong thing, somebody insulted you, they probably didn't even meet it, and so you, you kind of just, you just sort of sullied up somewhere, and God gets to moving, and you can't get in on it, and people get to shouting, and you can't shout, and they get to lifting their hands, and you can't raise your hand, and they go out and do something for God, and you go out seething and sulking. Why? Looking at the wrong person. Don't get your eyes on men. Get your eyes on Jesus. He'll never let you down. He'll never fail you. They're seething. Not only are they seething, but they're snorting. Does everybody know what I mean, snorting? This word murmur is an interesting word. Mr. Robertson in his, in his word, New Testament word study said this word murmured, it, it, it's used of the snorting of horses when they get angry. And you see that horse, if you have been around a horse and he gets angry, he'll lay them ears back. And those nostrils will flare out, and he'll start snorting out of them nostrils. That's what they were doing. If you looked over there, you'd seen them. They're looking at that woman. They got their ears laid back. Their nostrils are flared out, and they're, they're, I'll tell you what they're doing. They're blowing fire out of their nostrils. They're mad. They're upset. You ever seen that happen down in the house of God? Ain't much worship goes on when you're snorting like a horse because somebody made you angry. Somebody made you upset. No wonder the Bible tells us we're supposed to forgive. The Bible said, be it kind, tenderhearted, one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I tell you, we would quit our snorting. We would quit our anger if we'd remember how sorry we were and the Lord loved us anyway. How wicked we were and he died for us anyway. How sorry we were and he loved us anyway. We'd remember that. Get our eyes off the people and get our eyes on the Lord. They were seething and they were snorting and they were silenced because Jesus saw their seething and he saw their snorting and he said, hey, y'all hush up. Let her alone. Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? Why are y'all messed up over her? What are y'all looking over there for? Leave her be. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's not spend the rest of our days here waiting for Jesus judging one another. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? before his own master that he standeth and falleth. Let's, let's not spend the rest of our time saying, well, I would worship but so and so. No, you would worship, you would worship but you're not because of you, not because of them. You know, why would you, why would you, why would we waste our time looking at somebody else and letting them, they're worshiping and enjoying the Lord and we got some kind of judgment going on in us and so we can't worship. Why would we do that to ourselves? Why not just say, well, I, that, they're the Lord's servant. I'll let the Lord handle that. And I'll just make sure I'm right with God. And I'll just go to worship. I'll just go down to the house of God. And I'll just worship. Can I tell you something tonight? I'm going to worship him tonight whether you do or not. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to lift up his name. I'm going to remind myself how good he's been to me and how he's blessed me and where I was when he found me. And I'm just going to worship. I went to a meeting and we, the Lord always moves in. He always helps us. He's always, just always helps us. And there was a couple there I'd never seen before. And, uh, and, and so one after the service, the Lord had moved, and the music, he'd moved in the music, he'd moved into preaching. And after the service, I just rejoiced, rejoiced in the goodness of the Lord. And the fella walked up, him and his wife, and, and uh, he started talking to me. And before the conversation got very far, it was kind of like this. We're just not, worst, we're just not worth or, or, or used to this kind of thing. We're not just we're just not used to this kind of music, and we're just not we're just not used to this kind of thing in church. It's just not we're just not used to this kind of thing. And and I, I didn't say anything. I just I just said, well, I, the Lord helped us, and I'm so glad we got help. He said, we're just not used to it. And I noticed that's the last time I saw them. They didn't get in on the worship. They could have, but they were they were too busy looking how you were worshiping. Then we're thinking about how worthy He was. 
of worship. You know, Michal in the Old Testament is the mother of these men right at this moment. You remember Michal? She was married to David, and she was the daughter of Saul. And David had gone, and he got in the ark, and, and they'd put it on a new cart. And man, they'd had trouble because that wasn't the way they were supposed to bring it back. So they went and got it, and they did it the way God told them to do it, and they're coming back, and the Bible said is they're bringing that ark. Now, remember what the ark is. It represents the presence of God, and they're bringing it. So basically what David is doing is he's bringing God back into the midst of the people, and I'm going to tell you, it has, it has gladdened his heart. And so the Bible said he is, he is in a linen ephod, and, and if you read Chronicles and then and read Samuel and compare the two, he's wearing a robe all the way down, and then over that robe is a linen ephod, and he is dancing before the Lord. Now, he's not doing the grasshopper wiggle and the boogaloo or the twist or something like that. He's doing what little kids do at Christmas when they get the present they wanted. They go to jumping around saying, ha, 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 that's what I wanted, yeah, and they go to dancing around. That's the kind of dance that he's doing. He's leaping for joy, and he just he's just having a time, so he's... he's I would, I would try and show you, but we'd have to call 911. He's leaping, he's leaping for joy, and he's singing praises, and he's worshiping. And my cow is up in, the, up in the room. She's up in the house, and she's looking through a window. And she sees him out there. Here's what the Bible said. She despised him. She didn't like him worshiping like that. You know why? Here's, she tells us why. When he comes in, she said, how glorious was the king of Israel this day who uncovered himself before the maid servants. He wasn't uncovered. He was covered. But she considered him uncovered because she didn't think he was acting like a king. And she despised him, just like these men are despising this woman because of her worship. But you know what? David was not moved by that because he wanted to worship God. I'm just saying to you, let's not despise one another in our worship. Let's not hinder one another in our worship. Say, preacher, what can I do? Get your eyes off me, and I'll get my eyes off you, and we'll both put our eyes on Jesus, and we'll both feel like worshiping. We'll both want to praise him. We'll both want to lift him up. Let's just think about how good he's been to us. Let's think about what a wonderful Savior he is. Amen. That horrible pit he brought us out. Let's remember the rock we were hewn from, and then remember the rock we're now standing on, that rock that is higher than I and then we'll all feel like worshiping and we won't have any trouble with our worship. They missed their opportunity because they were looking at the prize and then they were looking at the person and then finally we miss our opportunity to worship because our eyes are on the present. So preacher, what do you mean the present? All right, now watch what, watch what the Bible said. John 14, here's what Jesus said. She hath done what she could. Listen to this now. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. John 14. She, now think about this word, aforehand. She has come aforehand. All right, now, the disciples are thinking about the present. They're looking around there saying, we got all these poor people. And she's taken 300 pence worth of ointment and broken the box or opened the box and poured it over the head and the feet of Jesus, probably poured it over the head and it, and it ran down the feet like we read in Psalm, is it 132 or 133? And, and, and she's wiping her, his feet with her hair. And the disciples are looking at this, at this picture here in these doings and they're thinking about the present. They're thinking about, man, we just passed a whole bunch of poor people on the way in here. They're thinking about the present. But Jesus said, she has come aforetime, before the fact. So what she's looking at is not what's happening right now. She's looking at what's fixing to happen down the road. They have not been listening. Because every time you turn around, Jesus has been saying to them, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. But she's been listening. And she's been listening to the fact that it won't be long and Jesus is going to die on a cross and he's going to be buried. And apparently she's been listening close enough. She knows there's going to be a resurrection. She may not understand all about it. But I think she looks at it and she said, you know what? He's going to die. He's going to be buried. And he's going to resurrect. And I ain't going to have time to anoint him. So I'm going to get it done right now. You know what she's doing? She's acting. 
walking by faith. She's looking down the road. She's listening to what he said, and she's acting upon what he said. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So she has, she's looking at tomorrow. She's not looking at today. Somebody said, well, preacher, I can't worship because of the circumstance I'm in. Well, quit looking at that and look down the road and see a God who's able to change your circumstance. Look down the road and see a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And I'm going to tell you something. We have an advantage over her. She had to look forward to see what he was going to do. We can look backward and see what he's already done and be reminded that there's more that he's going to do. He already fulfilled what he promised in the past. We can trust him for tomorrow. You get hung up in the present. You miss out on the faith that it takes to worship. He, they, they missed out on it. They're thinking of today. She's thinking of tomorrow. I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship because I know what he's going to do. <laughs> I trust him what he's going to do. I believe his promise. You say, preacher, why? Because he's kept every other promise he's made to me. Why would I think? The old song said there's no need to doubt him now. There is no need to doubt him now. And she's not doubting him. She's looking down the road. And I'm telling you, it'll help you worship if you get your eyes off your present condition and think about what God can do. And he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. They missed out on faith. Their eyes were on the present. They missed out on fellowship with him. Let me ask you a question. How close do you have to be to somebody to anoint them? I'd say you've got to be pretty close. I read in the Old Testament where Samuel anointed Saul and then kissed him. Got to be pretty close to do that. You know what I figure right now, right in this, right in this circumstance, I figure she's closer to him than anybody else in the room. And you know what worship does? It gets you close up to him. And I read this promise in my Bible. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. <laughs> Woo. My little grandsons come, and they'll come up, and they'll, they'll want to crawl in Papa's lap. And they'll get up and scrooch up close to me. You know what I do? I scrooch right back. I scrooch right up close to them. And the closer they get to me, the closer I get to them. And the tighter they hang on to me, the tighter I hang on to them. Here's a woman, you know what she's doing? She's scrooching up close to Jesus. She's getting just as close as she can. And I believe he's, he, I believe he's enjoying the fellowship with her. She is at that moment closer than any of his disciples. And one of the points of worship, one of the purposes of it is for us to bring, get closer unto him. You know what the Bible talks about magnifying him? You know what a magnification, you know what it is? It makes something bigger. It brings it closer closer than what it was. And when we magnify him, it brings him closer than we realize that he was. And when we worship him, it gets us close to him. They missed out on the faith of it. They missed out on the fellowship of it. And they missed out on the favor of it. Here's what Jesus said. She hath done what she could. I'm glad that he took note of that. There are things I cannot do, but there are things I can do. So he said, she has done what she could. And he favored her. He said this. He said, wherever it's, wherever it's preached, this is going to be brought up. And then the Bible made this, out, and, and, and this is another whole message. I can't deal with everything that's in here. But the Bible said when she broke that, that, that fragrance filled that whole room. Worship is a fragrant thing. And when you worship and you get up close to him, he'll favor you with his fragrance. He'll make your life fragrant. Let me say three things. Her worship was the occasion of his blessing. They received a rebuke. She received a reward. They received condemnation. She enjoyed a commendation because she worshiped. Now, before I close, I'm going to say this. You say, preacher, you're talking about worship. I'm not talking about jumping a pew. Although I've seen jump, people jump a pew when they worship. 
I'm not talking about running, although I've seen people run when they worship. I'm not talking about shouting, although sometimes we do shout when we're worshiping. I'm not even talking about crying, although many times I cry when I'm worshiping. But I'm talking about drawing close to him and taking everything that's dear to me and laying it at his feet, saying, Lord, this is all yours. My life, my hopes, my dreams. That's what Abraham's worship was. All my tomorrows, I give them to you. And when she worshiped, she got commended by the Lord. And here we are still talking about her worship. All these many years later. So I'm wondering tonight, what's keeping you from worshiping God? What's keeping you tonight from taking all you are and all you have and laying it at his feet and saying, Lord, you're worth more than anything I own, anything I want, anything I have. You're worth more than all of it. And I want you to have all of it. And I want you to have me. And I want to tell you how worthy you are. What's keeping you from your worship? I want you to bow your heads a moment.